Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to day four of the 2019 NGC Bocasville Fest. And I'm sitting with two people whom you probably recognize, but I'm going to introduce them again anyway. Um, Margaret Busby, who is the editor of the New Daughters of Africa, which we are launching at this year's festival. And the one and only Gary Young, whom you probably know as the editor at large of the UK Guardian and uh, a well-known writer on, on, the, on, the, on the United States and many other political um, issues. We have something in common in that we all knew Andrea Levy, um, some of us more intimately than others, but we all knew over a very long period of time. And we just wanted to, to reminisce on somebody who was a, a very important writer in changing um, the stakes, really, for people of um, Caribbean and African origin in the literary world in Britain and then, of course, elsewhere, because Andrew Levy went on to be um, a great bestseller, millions and millions of copies of books. So, I mean, a million, at least a million copies of books. So, she was very significant. I remember when I first, well, I met her in 1995 or something like that, but I remember interviewing her for a piece that I was writing for Caribbean Beat. And she said that what she really, really wanted to be was very famous. She wanted to be a famous writer. And the reason why she wanted to be a famous writer is that she wanted change. She didn't like what was happening to black people in Britain. And she wanted to effect change. And she said, I also want to be very, very rich. <laughs> well, you know that being very rich if you're a writer is not very easy. So uh, she managed to pull off all of those things. So I wanted to start this morning really by inviting Margaret and Gary to share some thoughts really about her. Um, Margaret, what's your fondest memory of her, you think? That's a difficult one. I, I sort of have bookends of memories which sort of encapsulate my friendship with Andrew. I remember right at the beginning when I first met her and she, we were discussing how she was getting into publishing and she told me that when she tried to find a literary agent and she'd actually been asked whether she'd done anything famous or illegal <laughs> because they really needed some sort of backstory in order to make it worth their while taking her on. And then we, we, we began a friendship which uh, sort of, it, it took off a bit when Marsha Hunt started a, a prize called the Saga Prize, mm -hmm. which was trying to champion new black British writing. Unpublished. Yeah. Unpublished black British writing. And, and Andrea, again, she, she, as a lot of us who were interested in black literature, had had to turn to African American writing to, to find um, a lot of things that reflected how we felt. And that absence of black British literature was something that um, Marsha Hunt picked up on as well because she had a daughter who was born black British. So, so this prize, I judged it one year, Andrea judged it another year. But then my, my last sort of bookend memory is uh, when I was about to um, start putting together New Doors of Africa in, in, in 2017, and of course I wanted to have Andrew in it. So we, we, we arranged to meet at the British Library and, and you know, she, she was then not too well, not well enough to write something new, but she really wanted to be in the book and she felt honored that she was being asked and, and she chose a, a, a passage from Small Island, the book that actually was her sort of breakthrough book. And, and so I, I just remember sitting there over lunch, chatting, joking with Andrea, and you know, just, just ha hanging out. Well, we come back for you to read that, but Gary, how do you remember her? Um, so I, Andrea was a close friend, and um, <clears throat> I first met her in the, about 1998 at a Guardian summer party, and she was standing by herself. And um, I'd read uh, her first two books that stage. And I went up to her and I was talking to her and she was deeply suspicious. And, um, um, and I worried at a certain point that she thought I was hitting on her or something. And I, I really wasn't. And, um, uh, and it got to a, a, a point where I said to her, well, it would be really nice to meet you again. You know, we talked about her work. So I said, really nice. To put me. And she said, why? And I said, you know, just me, just two black people having lunch, that's not against the law, is it? And she said, I'm not going to tell you anything, you know. 
And I said, okay, okay, maybe I'll just tell you things. And, um, and we met for lunch and we became, she was like a very loving, sometimes slightly mean older sister. She was like an older sister. So she would say, you know, when I was, uh, she came to one of my birthday parties, I was 37, and she said, uh, she said, how old are you? And I said, 37, and she went, oh. I said, what's that? What is that? And she said, you're not a young man anymore. Um, and my favorite, my, my two favorite memories, one is a story that I told at her, uh, funeral, which was that um, she had turned down every um, offer of an OBE or an MBE, the whole empire thing. She wasn't going to do that. And we'd had that conversation many times, spoken in very principled ways about why she thought that writers shouldn't do that and um, uh, what she thought the problem was. and. Um, and she didn't begrudge other people to do it, but she wasn't going to do it herself. So she's telling this story. This must have been, I don't know, a year or so before uh, she passed. And uh, apparently, whoever it is in the deep state who organizes these things called her agent and said, what will she accept? They knew she was dying. They went, what will she accept? And so I'm expecting Andrew then to say, bloody cheek, you know, like, you kind of can't by me. And she said, and I told him, Dame. <laughs> And I said, Dame? And she said, yeah, Dame, that's the best one you can get. She said, she said, if I'm going out, I'm going out big. I said, don't come back until you've got a Dame. And uh, which, uh, you know, I thought was hilarious. And then the other one, because she is the godmother, um, uh, or part of the god team, as you will soon understand, to my daughter, Zora. Um, so we're sitting around her dinner table one evening, and apropos nothing really, she starts talking about how children hate her and how they think that they're going to turn her into a handbag, <laughs> that she's going to turn them into a handbag and that she's just kind of, they look at her and they think, oh my God. And, uh, and we're all laughing away and then, you know, it gets to the dessert and we said, well, Bill, her partner, something we'd like to share with you, um, you know, we'd like you to be the um, uh, Zora's godfather. And Bill said, that's really nice, thanks very much, blah, 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 and Karen eating dessert. And Andrew's like, well, what about me? <laughs> and I was like, what about, you just said children think that you're going to turn them into handbags. Why would you want to do it? And why would I want you to do it if that's... And she said, no, but it's your daughter. And, and, um, and I was like, and even Bill, who very rarely contradicted her, was like, I don't think it's crazy that they didn't ask you after what you just said. And, um, and I said, she said, well, um, maybe we can do it together. And I said, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's not, a, you know, it's not an official thing, really. It's not actually like she's getting christened. It's a, um, yeah, it's, um, um, you know, be there for her. And she's like, no, I don't want to do it now because you've made me. You've, you, I've made you do it, haven't I? I've made you. And I was like, for the love of God, Andrew, do it, don't do it. But like, you know, and, um, and she did, and she got into it and she would, um, she was, she, she didn't make her into a handbag. She bought her very nice little dresses and things like that. I think that that is exactly why probably we like her work so much because she's very matter of fact about things. But let me tell you a little bit more about her before we go on, because we can't assume you know everything about her. She was born in 1956 and she died in February of this year. She wrote a book called Every Light in the House Burning in 1994, which was actually long listed for the Orange Prize in 1995. It was her, yeah, that was her first book. Then Never Far From Home, From Nowhere, which was 1996. Um, which was when I met her, Margaret, because in case of any of you are too young to remember who Marsha Hunt is, Marsha Hunt was this incredible woman who was the first black woman to be on the front cover of Vogue magazine because she was in Hair, the famous 1960s musical, and famous for having had a child by Mick Jagger, Mick Jagger who is a person who Margaret was actually referring. <laughs> And um, she was also in the new Daughters of Africa, Marsha? 
So she was also in Daughters of Africa in 1992, Marsha. She was an incredible woman, and she, she spotted that there was a problem what, with what was going on in British literature, as Margaret described. And she started this prize, and I remember she was living in Folkestone, down on the sea in Britain. And it was the year that Andrew Levy judged the prize that I went, that I think Bernadine Evaristo won it that year. Of course, Bernadine Evaristo has gone on to be a very successful writer of eight prize-winning novels, etc., etc. But um, Marsha Hunt um, is one of those enormous talents who was a trailblazer, and then she just sort of petered out because she, she fell ill and then sort of disappeared, really. She moved to Ireland. Yeah. She moved to Ireland and she had um, breast cancer and she, I, I don't know, she just disappeared, really. Anyway, so Fruit of the Lemon was published then in 1999, Small Island in 2004, and that's what really changed um, Andrew's life because it won the Orange Prize, the Whitbread Prize, the Commonwealth Writers Prize, and made her lots of money. Then the Long Song in 2010, which was the, uh, her, her a very famous book on slavery, and then Uriah's War in 2014, and Margaret's got this book here, which is a collection of short stories, which one six short stories which um, Gary says, tell us a story of that one. Well, um, I remember getting it and her going, oh, that book. And it was, she had done the long, she'd done, when she did um, Small Island, uh, she said that she was retiring. And then she said, well, I'm retiring from striving, really. And then she, you know, she had to come back with, um, uh, with the long song. And then she said to them, she had cancer by that stage. Um, and um, she's like, I'm not doing another one. And her publishers were like, but, <laughs> you know, it's going real well now. Now would be the time. And so they came out with that, which she just thought was, these were things that had been around for a while. That's why it's called Six Stories in an Essay, because she couldn't kind of be asked to call it more. Th she was like, you just take, I mean, they're good, actually. And I said to her, oh, I just read it, and I thought it was, I thought it was pretty good. And she goes, yeah, pretty good. <laughs> like, you know. Um, uh, but I just wanted to share this quite sweet memory, which was a period just after after, um, when she retired from striving, before she really started working on a long song, was that her and Bill had this routine where every day, Bill would take a cookbook and throw it down on the, um, on the counter, and that whatever page it opened on, that was what they were gonna cook. Uh, what he was gonna cook, Andrew didn't cook anything. And, um, uh, and then, and she would, um, uh, do little bits and bobs of, of writing in the morning. Then they would go shopping for the ingredients. Then they would come back. Andrew would have a nap, and Bill would start cooking. And then, and then, then they would eat in the evening. And they were real homebodies. Those two. They had a little map of where they lived uh, on the next to the front door, with a safety pin in it, which was where they parked their car, because they kept forgetting where their car was parked. And that was, it's, you know, they were kind of a little old couple from the age of about 35. I mean, that was one of the things about her. She was a wee little small island person. She was a wee little Englander. Mm -hmm. She never wanted to travel. You know, she only came to Jamaica once in her life for two weeks. And um, I tried my best to get her to come here, but she wouldn't come. Um, Although I told her that I'd been invited and she was like, oh, you should go to that. It's really good. <laughs> I like loyal friends, yeah. <laughs> uh, but the thing about her too, is she was very irreverent and she was very funny. Mm. And what I loved most about her was the way in which she just scrambled everything. She showed, I think, well, we could talk about why Small Island was popular. I have a particular theory about that. But I think what was great about her is that she never read a book until she was 23 years old. and. She only started writing from the way she'd watch things on television. So if you read her writing, it's very filmic. I want to read a little piece from, um, from this book here, Fruit of the Lemon. And 
she 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 really does write like a film script. I'm not. I think that one of her books has been turned or has been turned into a film or is being put on in theatre. Uh, Small Island's just gone on stage. Yeah. <clears throat> so she actually worked in the costume department of the BBC for. Can a while. everybody hear, or is this okay? I know it's a struggle. Sorry. So she's gone for a job and she's turned up at the BBC. Oh God, it's getting worse. She says, I've come for the costume. I started before the man said, then you are for me. He held out his hand for me to shake. I went to take the gloved hand, but the man tutted and withdrew it. He began removing the glove by pulling on each finger in turn. I stood with my hand out feeling ridiculous. He finally removed the whole glove with a sleeping flourish and shook my hand. Henry, he said, I suppose I'm your boss, although we, although we don't like to think we have bosses here. I stood still in the middle of the room. This is getting ridiculous. It's a bit distracting. I think it's actually a rally. Are they moving out there? Are they moving? Okay, let's try again. I stood still in the middle of the room, watching while Henry took off his coat. He unbuttoned it carefully, then put it on a wooden hanger, flicking at the lapels and shoulders before placing it into a cupboard. He then got the coat out again and twiddled with one of the buttons, pulling at a thread, while I, not knowing what else to do, stared. He put the coat back in the cupboard and locked it with a key, which he took out of the lock and placed in his trouser pocket. When he looked at me again, he gave a little jump and bit his lip, which made him look like a little boy with no, with a, and not a middle-aged man. Oh, look at me. I've forgotten all about you already. I had such a good morning, you wouldn't believe it. But come and sit down. He indicated at a table, which had three chairs around it. I went over and sat in a chair. Not there, dear, Henry said. That's my seat. I got up and moved to the next chair. Well, you could sit there, but I'm sure Madam would have something to say about it. I moved along to the other chair and looked at Henry. There was nowhere else to go. That's a good one, he smiled. That's where Evelyn used to sit. She's the one you're taking over from. He sat in the chair and leant forward as if he was going to tell me a secret. She's gone to work in production, he whispered, for the kiddies' programs. She was a high flyer, that one. I could tell the moment she walked in. I knew she wouldn't stay here. He leant back. They all start here, but they want to do something else, really. They think of it just as a foot in the door. He folded his arms and stared at me. I expect you want to direct, don't you? He held his head back and roared an open mouth laugh. I smiled. My fantasy was more that I would be standing in the lift. A director comes in, stares at me for several minutes then tells me that I must be in his film, that now he has seen me, no one else will do, and I would be whisked away from the costume department to a life of celebrity. But as I watched Henry laugh, I felt stupid. What's your name? He asked, but carried on. Listen to me, rabbiting on. Still, you'll have to get used to it. I hope you aren't going to be quiet. You have to learn to speak up for yourself in this place. He looked at me, and I stared at him. After a while, Henry said, name? And it carries on like that. But it's very much, if you've seen um, British comedy, she writes like British comedy. And all of her writing, um, you could actually see it. And I think that's one of the things that, one of the elements that made Small Island um, very, uh, very readable and very popular. I mean, she, she, um, she said to me, that one time I actually did a formal interview with her. Um, <clears throat> and she said, because her first couple of books, first three really, um, Never Far From Nowhere, Every Light in the House Burning, and um, Through the Lemon, are quite autobiographical, kind of centered, centered around her, and it's almost the same family. There's a, there's a light-skinned woman, there's a dark-skinned, so there's some class, um, uh, there's some kind of class traveling. 
and she was she she was a judge for either the Whitbread or the Booker or one of those, and she said having to read these books back to back, these big books with scope and um, big arms. Strong. She she said, oh my God, I've been thinking too small, and um, I have to I have to think bigger. I have to. Uh, and that in, inspired her, not, she'd already thought about, she, she was already in the process of writing small one, but it gave her kind of more ambition as to what she could, uh, what, what, um, what she could do with it. Yeah, I think maybe I should read a bit from the passage in Small Island that she chose to be included in, in uh, New Daughters of Africa. And in fact, when, when we launched the book, um, it was the day of her funeral. Can you hear? You can't hear, Margaret. Margaret, it's just... Well, can you hear any better now? Well, we launched uh, New Daughters of Africa on the, on the day of Andrea's funeral, and we, we dedicated the, the event to her. And I thought I'd read something from the extract from Small Island that she chose to be included in the book. Let me ask you to imagine this. Living far from you is a beloved relation whom you have never met. What is it? This is what it's like at carnival time. They're marching for Jesus. I bet he can hear them. What, but in a circle? The square's a circle. <laughs> How long does it go on? Well, it's waves of it, so that's right. There you go. We got a little. We got a little gap in the market now. Okay. Let me ask you to imagine this: living far from you is a beloved relation whom you have never met. Yet this relation is so dear a kin she is known as mother. Your own mummy talks of mother all the time. Oh, mother is a beautiful woman, refined, mannerly, and cultured. Your daddy tells you, mother thinks of you as her children, like the Lord above. She takes care of you from afar. Her photographs are cherished, pinned in your own family album to be admired over and over. Your finest, your best, everything you have that is worthy is sent to mother as gifts. And on her birthday, you sing song and party. Then one day you hear mother calling. She is troubled, she needs your help. Leave home, leave familiar, leave love. Travel seas with waves that swell about you as substantial as concrete buildings. Shiver, tire, hunger, for no sacrifice is too much to see you at mother's needy side. This surely is an adventure. After all, after all you have heard, can you imagine, can you believe, soon, soon you will meet mother? The filthy tramp that eventually greets you is she. Can this be that fabled relation you heard so much of? This twisted, crooked, weary woman? This stinking, cantankerous hag? She offers you no comfort after your journey, no smile, no welcome. Yet she looks at you through kind, through lordly eyes and says, who the bloody hell are you? You know I'm talking of England. You know I'm speaking of the mother country. But Britain was at war, you might want to tell me. Of course she would not be at her best. But for me, I had just one question. Let me ask the mother country just this one simple question. How come, how come England did not know me? Now see this, an English soldier, Tommy Atkins, skin as pale as soap, hair slicked with oil and shinier than his boots. See him sitting in a pub, sipping a glass of warming rum and rolling a cigarette from a tin. 
Ask him, Tommy, Tommy, no? where is Jamaica? And here he reply, well, don't know, Africa, innit? And here is Lady Havelock, living in her big house with her ancestors' pictures crowding the walls. Ask her to tell you about the people of Jamaica. Does she see that small boy standing tall in the classroom where sunlight draws lines across the room, speaking of England, of canals, of parliament, and the greatest laws ever passed? Or might she, with some authority from a book she'd read, tell you of savages, jungles, and swinging through trees? It was inconceivable that we Jamaicans, we West Indians, we members of the British Empire, would not fly to the mother country's defense when there was threat. But tell me, if Jamaica was in trouble, is there any major, any general, any sergeant who would have been able to find that dear island? Give me a map. Let me see if Tommy Atkins or Lady Havelock can point to Jamaica. Let us watch them turning the page round, screwing up their eyes to look, turning it over to see if perhaps the region was lost on the back before struggling, before struggling defeat. But give me that map blindfold me, spin me round three times, and I, dizzy and dazed, would still place my finger squarely on the mother country. Um, <clears throat> I mean, it was one of the interesting contradictions, I think it's a contradiction, or at least complexities with Andrea, which was that she had only been to Jamaica uh, twice, I think, because she came to do some research for uh, the Long Song as well, for about a week. But she, she didn't like traveling. Um, she hadn't spent much time here. Um, and um, but she felt very deeply about this region's importance and its importance for itself and for Britain's reckoning of its own self, that Britain was incapable of understanding itself without understanding this past. And that um, she spent... Sorry. Just got As we stream in, you should mention that there's something happening in the road while we have these long Um she spent a lot of her final two, three years really trying to leverage the status that she had gained through Small Island in particular, particularly to get the BBC, um, because she said, well, they at least have a public service remit to cover the Caribbean properly. And she would tear her hair out about kind of, how many documentaries are you gonna have? They'll say, we did one two years ago. And they'd be like, how many are you gonna do on D-Day, on the Normandy landings? So and, and um, you know, one's not enough. And she, she, um, she pushed and pushed. And the week in which she died was the week in which there was this terrible, ignorant row about Churchill and whether he was racist or not, which of course he was, um, and whether he was a good wartime leader or not, which he also was, and the notion that you can't be both at the same time. And actually, to be a good war wartime leader, sometimes maybe you... You, racism doesn't hurt actually um, and then there was a um, the Windrush debate was still uh, uh, going on and she she felt those things very keenly so she was this kind of very 
hyper local. That trip up to the shops with Bill that she would make to do the shopping was often as far as she would go for like a week. Uh, but she had a very, very global sensibility. Um, uh, my reading is from uh, Araya's War. Um, actually, no, it's not. It's from, um, it's from the first essay. Um, another interesting small fact about Andrea, which I used to tease her that her family were a bit like Forrest Gump, in that they were at kind of major events in black British history, was that her dad was on Windrush, actually, literally on Windrush. She was, uh, and he's in the Pathé uh, news clips. And her granddad was in the British West Indian Regiment that, um, uh, in the First World War. Um, but this is um, from an essay which starts with a racist incident in, uh, on a bus. Um, no one would claim that out of many of Britain's stories of empire, the Caribbean is the most important. But it's one of the earliest, one of the longest in duration, and certainly one of the most unusual in terms of population mix and the creation of unique societies. In other parts of Britain's old empire, such as India or Africa, we can debate what fading legacy the British have left, whether it's railways or bureaucracies or parliamentary systems. But in the Caribbean, the legacy is, in one sense, everything. Not just the towns, the cities, and the landscape, but the very people themselves, their origins, their ethnic mix, their hybrid cultures, all result from what the British did on those islands before they finally left them. And conversely, Britain growing to become a world power, its attitudes to race, and even how it sees itself today, these things are in no small part the legacy that the British Caribbean has left for modern Britain. The very notion of Great Britain's greatness, the cultural theorist Stuart Hall once wrote, is bound up with empire. Euroscepticism and little Englander nationalism could hardly survive if people understood whose sugar flowed through British blood and rotted English teeth. I think you should stop. Um, for people who are actually joining us uh, in the live stream, the, um, this is being interrupted by a demonstration outside, which is affecting the sound quality. You probably can hear it. It's certainly interrupting our discussion, so we apologize. We will resume. Apparently, there are four trucks that are going to go past. And we, I think I've counted this might be the fourth, so we might be in for a good 15 minutes. <laughs> Would you like to carry on, Gary? What this means, of course, is that I and my family are products of Britain just as much as the white kids I grew up with in Highbury. Given Britain's history in the Caribbean, it was almost inevitable that people like my dad and his fellow passengers on the Windrush would end up here. They belonged, whether Britain realized it or not. And one of the consequences of having an empire, of being a cultural hub, is that the world ultimately comes to you. That's how hubs work. Britons of Caribbean heritage have been in this country in significant numbers for 65 years now. We're three or four generations on from the man on the London bus, the, the racist. Immigration to Britain since the end of the Second World War has been a final, unexpected gift to Britain from its old empire. The benefits that the labour and the enterprise of immigrants like those from the Caribbean have brought to Britain are incalculable. Their ideas, their creativity and their ways of life have helped turn this country into a sophisticated multiculture. The windfall of talent and variety is one of great unforeseen benefits to Britain. But there are still countless young Britons today of Afro-Caribbean descent who have as little understanding of their ancestry and have as little evidence of their worth as I did when I was growing up. And there are countless white Britons who are unaware of the histories that bind us together. Britain made the Caribbean that my parents came from. It provided the people, black and white, who make up my ancestry. In return, my ancestors, through their forced labor and their enterprise, contributed greatly to the development of modern Britain. My heritage is Britain's story too. It's time to put the Caribbean back where it belongs, in the main narrative of British history. And I think the thing about Small Island, really, was that 
certainly from sorts of programs that I made for the BBC, and the reason why they were popular, there was a belief in the BBC. Uh, there wasn't a lot of programming for people of minorities, because I think the people in charge thought that people would run away. But it's not true. When we started making programs for ethnic minorities, more people came on board. And I think that's one of the things about Small Island. It actually explained Britain to the British. And I think it was a great eye-opener, um, certainly for the great British public. I don't know what about, I don't know about Caribbean people. One of the things that was interesting to me is when I came back to Trinidad and I was involved in a book reading group, many of the people here didn't appreciate uh, small island the way that people in Britain did. Because I think that that experience of living in Britain um, maybe is a uniquely Caribbean British thing. I don't know. I want to open it out to the floor and see if you've got any questions that Margaret and Gary, who knew her particularly well, might be able to answer. If you had any comments. If we can manage with the noise. Uh, Talk loudly because we got some okay, competition. Thank you very much for this discussion. I once heard her say or or saw an article in which she Can't said that she um she went to the public library every day to write. Sorry, that, she... that she went to the public library every day to write. Uh -huh. And I would and I was thinking about that in relation to the fact that by the time um Small Island came out, she had been a, a writer of of note for a long time. Mm. By the time many of us heard about her, she had already accumulated a lot of material. So I, I'm thinking about that kind of daily slog, daily unsexy slog of the writer. And I was just wondering if you had anything to say about that. I think you need to wait. I didn't answer. catch the last bit, but I think we should wait for this. Yeah. yeah. Let's just wait for a minute. Praise the Lord. Maybe we need to dance. I just dance. Yeah. <laughs> you can imagine over carnival, this goes on day and night for two days. The only way to have fun during it is to do it too. Okay, maybe we could resume. Did you catch? Yeah. Okay, could you I just repeat just the end the of the question? Not a question at all. It's just a reflection on the right. fact that I thought I saw once that she talked about a, a kind of daily practice, not just of writing, but of doing so at the public at her public library. So I was just kind of think as just putting that kind of daily unsexy slog of writing and writing. But I was putting that together with the thought that by the time many of us heard about her through Small Island, she had already accumulated a body of work. So I'm trying to think about what, what that means to write, even knowing that many people, that, that, you're, that you're not popular or not yet popular. It's not a, a question. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's an interesting thing about her trajectory that she writes three books that um, are all critically acclaimed and, um, and, and quite niche. That, like, I mean, not, not in their scope, but in kind of who reads them. And then, um, and she had this joke about, she'd say mid middle age and middle list is, is a very lonely place, you know. And, um, and then uh, Small Island comes out. Um, she wins the orange prize. Uh, and she says, and she's thinking, maybe this is it. Maybe it will. And she says, after a couple of weeks, it's like, not really. And she's thinking, she's not really going to do this, but me as a grand metaphor, of just going around house to house with the books and saying, look, just try it. I'll come back next week. If you don't like it, you can give me it back. Just give it a try. And then she wins the whip bread. Uh, and then there's this little, lot, and then whoosh, it just goes um, uh, bananas. And of course, she's the same person, but nobody else who's discovering her kn knows that. So she then, uh, and she felt very kind of um, quite uncomfortable about being 
in any way a public figure. She didn't do any punditry or any, you know, any anything like that. Um, but that it was for most of her career, she was doing that virtually unknown would be too strong, but certainly not in anybody's canon or anybody or anywhere near it, unless your canon was black Caribbean or black British uh, writing. Any other? Kaz? Get the microphone here, please. Um, I, I, is this on? Yes. Okay. I like uh, your um, description of her and Bill as, you know, local, ex extremely local. Um, I'm, I'm wondering because I knew Andrea, as you know, and I read with her in Paris and in Italy. So she did travel. Mm. Um, and I'm thinking, what was the criteria, you think, for her and Bill to actually go beyond the local shop and travel and do something as opposed to, you know, the terrific description you have as them as homebodies? Because they did go out there. They did, although not much. I mean, not not much. The, 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 and um, it was. And I re, I remember, I was going to interview Roddy Doyle, and I I was talking to her because I think I was going the next day. And I said he lives within about twenty minutes from where he grew up, which I think is very suspicious. And she kind of rounded on me and was like, "This was the kind of slightly mean older sister thing," and was like, "What's wrong with that?" What's, and, and she was right, of course. It's like, uh, yeah, okay, okay. Um, I just feel like it's not, uh, you know, it doesn't suggest a big, uh, you know, a big vista of kind of, so she had no wonderlust. And I think particularly, I don't know, for my experience of people from the Caribbean, we're traveling people. We've, you know, we're, we're in Britain and we, we, we're diasporic and I'm going to visit my uncle in Canada or wherever. And um, uh, I think the motivation for her traveling had to be really, really clear. Like, I'm going to promote my book or uh, I'm going to support such and such a thing. But I think I'm right in saying she was offered an honorary degree at UE, I think. Uh, uh, in the Mona campus. I think this is true. If it's not, blame Margaret. Um, <laughs> no, I think she was offered an honorary. She was offered some kind of accolade. Let's leave it there. In uh, Jamaica. And uh, when she heard that she had to actually go in order to get it, she said, oh, no, it's okay. Like, so even, even for self-interest, even for self-aggrandizement, so I guess it was that lack of, I have to think, if I'm offered a chance to go somewhere, I have to think of reasons not to go, which now I've got kids, I've got lots of them, but I still have to think, well, why wouldn't I go there? That would be interesting to see that and so on. Where she, that was, there had to be a very different, definite reason for her to go somewhere. Yeah, um, I saw the documentary as well and the television of the, on, of the book and um, I saw the part where she was desc describing her process and you're talking about how she, um, her daily routine. Mm. Can you speak uh, more about that? Because my, the sense I got was that it was almost sacred to her. It was, uh, yeah, just, just could you just say a little bit more about that, please? As I understand it, she didn't, she didn't write in the afternoon. She, I mean, she wouldn't write in the afternoon. So she would, um, uh, she get up, there would be a breakfast and then she would disappear into her room. And um, she had a rule and it was something like no more than 200 words a day or something. It was something really weird. Like m most people have a lower limit and she had an upper limit. And um, she was quite a slow writer, by her own admission, and, um, and quite a meticulous researcher. So there would be lots of um, uh, interviews with ex-servicemen for um, uh, Small Island and with uh, Bill's mum, 
uh, who lived, you know, so, so, so there was uh, that too. And then with the, um, and then there would be lunch, Bill making something, and then she would do admin. And that was, that was her day. And it was pretty, pretty awkward. So I used to stay there when I came back from the States for a few days or whatever, I used to stay with them. And that was, that was pretty much, I think, how it worked. I just want, is it, is it working? I just wanted to say in response to Marina's comment about um, the, in the book club, um, Small Island not being particularly appreciated, that at Cave Hill, at UE Cave Hill, we've taught Small Island on um, a particular graduate course and the students loved it. And they loved it partly, I think, because they know the history of Caribbean writing and they know that people went to London and um, you know, began their careers there. But what they don't necessarily know until they read someone like Andrea Levy is to what extent contemporary British literature is still, you know, has many prominent writers of Caribbean origin. So for them, it was very exciting. Any other comments, questions? This is a very unformed thought and observation, but I think this is the mic. <laughs> um, I'm thinking about Stuart Hall, who left Jamaica and I think went back twice, and Andrea Levy, who left, who, who was born in England, right, who went to Jamaica twice. And I'm thinking about their class position, their color uh, status in the Jamaican context. And I'm wondering if, you know, Andrea's distance from Jamaica, literal distance, had anything to do with color and class. Any thoughts about that? Color and class, did you yes. say? I mean, part of the thing about literal distance in that sense, uh, and this would be true for me too, growing up, my parents from Barbados, I went back once when I was four because it was really expensive. So if you're working class, then the, the possibility of going back is, is quite limited. Obviously, later in life, she, um, she could have done. But I, I think that she, she had a thing about whether she should be considered a Caribbean writer, even. That she, said, she said, I've only been there twice. And it's that push-me-pull-you thing that we have um, as kind of, in some ways, the bastard children of England, which is that we have to insist on our Britishness, even as we complicate it, um, uh, which is to say, I'm British, but not like you, you know, not like you or you. And so, even as she very kind of fiercely claimed the Caribbean, in as she advocated for it, uh, the BBC, or as she kind of uh, pursued it in her work, I'm not. Uh, it wasn't kind of something that she necessarily felt the need to pursue in her kind of. Uh, in her personal life. I don't know that that has much, she was very light skinned, Andrew. I don't know that it has much to do with the, with her colorism, really. I don't think, I don't, I don't think that's why. Margaret, no, I wondered whether it was partly to do with the fact that she did not learn that much from her parents about mm. um, the West Indies, the Caribbean, until she began to write herself, or in fact, until her father died. And I think it may have been because when her parents were in Jamaica, uh, I suppose that light skin yeah. thing yeah, yeah. made them have a certain status which did not apply when they came to, to, to Britain. Well, she actually said that she grew up, um, because her mother was very color, color conscious, like the character in Small Island, she, um, she grew up considering herself to be a white person and she grew up on this estate um, in, in London considering herself to be a white person. And of course, suddenly they would become darkies when some, you know, some other element moved into the area. But as Margaret says, she really didn't know anything about not being um, 
other until, or oh, about being other until she started, until she really grew up. And I think that her big, prob her big thing really was the disappointment of her parents as Jamaicans living in Britain. I think that was her motivating force. All her writing about reclaiming this for them and the way in which they'd been treated. Um, and I think, thank God, she had this incredible sense of, of uh, you know, the comedy of life, really, that helped her to get through everything. I mean, there's a short passage here that I want to read a little bit about, of, which expresses this. She's going to Jamaica for the first time, and um, she's not grown up with Caribbean people. She says, I was half through, she's going to do research in Jamaica for the first time, and she lands in Miami. This is a little, little bit. She says, I was halfway through the lounge making my way to the Jamaican Airlines check-in when I saw them. Shabby looking people, shabby looking black people with men dressed in baggy trousers held up to the waist with belts, with jackets that from a distance looked smart but close up was stained and torn. Women with huge bottoms in tight fitting skirts with no tights and sandals on their feet and flowery print blouses that, stained across, that strained across their breasts. There were only about 20 of them, but they looked so out of place in the plush setting of an American airport. They looked too poor to fly, and they were checking in cardboard boxes into the airline's weighing scales, boxes that my parents would have discarded as too flimsy and thin to have been of any use. They talked in patois, a language of all, all of its own, with the occasional word that a woman like me, who had grown up around the Jamaican accent with a naman and cha and sucking of teeth, could be lulled into thinking I might understand if only I'd listened harder or they would speak slower. And, she, and this is a really interesting book because it's part of her experience of being in Jamaica, which you don't really capture in many of the others. Um, well, I just wanted to, before we close, we've got another couple of minutes, I just wanted you to leave us perhaps with your, you know, with the one thing that we should take away about, about Andrew Levy. Um. I mean, she was, um, she was very, very keen, having, having strived for success, on, to, but having strived for it on her own terms, really on her own terms, that kind of, she didn't want to go to any of the parties, she didn't see the need say, to get on a plane and go and get an accolade. She kind of, she, she, she wasn't at all attracted by the baubles. And it wasn't like you could say, oh, Andrew, so-and-so's, so-and-so's coming for dinner. And if, if, if she was interested or she wasn't, and she was interested on the basis of who they were, not, oh, he's famous. And um, she always used to, um, support me not becoming a what she called a gob on a stick so doing um uh punditry uh, and and so on um so she was she, she was and that was true before she was before she got the kind of public acclaim and afterwards and so for her while the trajectory of her career goes like that the trajectory of herself remains quite even she remains a homebody she uh, but there is a comfort there is a comfort for her in the room that i used to sleep in were all the translations of small island she'd never had a book translated before then and there they are in all their different covers in all their different languages and there was a sense that she used to say or she said this time when i interviewed her she said when she grew up she had shop girl written all uh, across her head that's what people thought you know that's you're going to be and so this notion of um this isn't bad for a shop girl you know look at these look 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 where i've come and she used to say and i'll wind up here that uh and bill um, in his testimony at her funeral that they would be going somewhere like she went to meet the Queen uh, when she got the Commonwealth Writers Prize and and I said oh well, that's interesting the Queen she says I'll have a cup of tea with anybody Gary <laughs> um, and she um, uh, she would say to him oh Bill look what I've got us into now 
And then they would be off, this little old couple before their time, off to these kind of, you know, to these, to these wonderful things, shop girl, you know, at all these awards. Yeah, I think Gary summed it up perfectly. I mean, she, she was who she was and she didn't change. She had no pretensions. She could be irreverent, funny, wicked. And, and she, I don't think she really realized what she'd done in, in making those connections between her own heritage and Caribbean history and, and British history, which was why she made such an impact. Not, it's not only on the black readership, but on the whole readership of, of Britain and elsewhere. I mean, she was really one of a kind, even though she was just an ordinary person. Would you give Margaret and Gary a huge round of applause, please? <laughs>